Hi, I'm Bruce Eimer, and welcome to this beginning workshop on pain control hypnosis, which is titled Taming Chronic Pain with Hypnosis. I will explain what taming pain means in a little while. Uh, I'm a psychologist. I've been practicing for over 35 years and using hypnosis for about 32 of those 35 years with a lot of success using hypnosis as a treatment tool in providing counseling and psychotherapy to individuals with a wide range of issues. I developed an interest in chronic pain about 35 years ago, and I've been using hypnosis with people that suffer from pain, persistent pain disorders for about 35 years. And I've found as I've refined the techniques I've been using, and as I've studied with some of the masters, that hypnosis as a treatment tool is amazing in terms of its effectiveness in helping people with treatment resistant and recalcitrant uh, pain syndromes to get relief. Uh, hypnosis is very effective both in medical settings as well as in mental health settings and I provide training to mental health professionals which would include psychiatrists, psychologists, licensed clinical social workers, licensed clinical counselors, etc., etc. I provide training to medical professionals such as physicians and nurse practitioners and dentists. And I also provide training to people that wear the moniker as professional hypnotherapists. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there's a, a tremendous number of untreated people that suffer needlessly from persistent pain syndromes that are just sort of written off by the medical system and become very alienated and disenchanted because the medical system they feel has failed them. And the truth is, in the majority of cases, it has. I work as the co-director of a pain clinic in a very busy hospital, uh, teaching hospital outside of Philadelphia for seven years. And I saw many of these alienated patients who were labeled as drug seekers, some of them truly were, and some of them were just trying to get relief. Some of them had been trying to get relief for years and had been mismanaged by their physicians medically, pharmaceutically, and they became dependent and addicted to opioids or narcotics. Uh, but the point is, is that unfortunately, medical students learn very little, if anything, about pain management, and if they do, they learn about you know, the use of medications. Uh, the use of opioids has now been frowned upon in the last uh, decade and a half because of the publicity surrounding the fatalities associated with the illegal distribution of opioids and the deaths. And as a result of that, many people with chronic pain, welcome, come on in, uh, feel free to settle in. Uh, the uh, people that have real serious pain problems whose pain is responsive two opioid medications are finding it harder and harder and sometimes impossible to obtain the medications because of the restrictions that have resulted from lobbying efforts to curtail the so-called opioid crisis. The problem is compounded by the fact that hypnosis is an evidence-based tool for the treatment of chronic pain that has been around since the Egyptians in the sleep temples the Greeks in their sleep temples, and it has been used very successfully for the past 200 years and has been documented by some of the fathers of modern hypnosis, including Mesmer and Eliotson and, 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 and a host of others that were surgeons and physicians back in the 19th century who utilized hypnosis as their sole form of anesthetic. Uh, in the last 25 years, Hypnosis has been written up in respected peer-reviewed journals and has been shown to be an evidence-based, empirically validated treatment tool that enhances the efficacy of treatment by therapists, hypnotherapists, and medical and dental professionals. And I always state that, number one, that one who knows how to use hypnosis as a treatment tool uh, should refrain from using hypnosis with patients who have syndromes and conditions that they're not qualified to treat. As therapists and hypnotherapists, 
Uh, raise your hand if you are a hypnotherapist therapist. Uh, in, please, so I can see what, who is in this room, okay? And raise your hand if you are a uh, medical professional, meaning a nurse or a physician. Are you a physician? Dental surgeon. You're a dental surgeon, okay. Are you Bryce? Yeah. Uh, hi, welcome, <laughs> welcome, welcome. So, uh, Bryce Lemire is here. Bryce is a well-respected uh, dental surgeon in France who is an expert in hypnosis and is a trainer for the, uh, for the Elements, the Element Institute, and of course uh, knows a lot about using hypnosis for pain management. Uh, in any event, welcome, I'm glad you're here. And what we're gonna do is we have a lot to cover in this brief two-hour workshop. So I'm gonna leave about 20 minutes at the end for questions so that we're not gonna stop for questions because I wanna cover a lot of material. And I wanna tell you that this is just the bare bones skeleton of a, uh, I'm launching a program. Uh, well, let me back up for a minute and just simply say that few dental and medical professionals, as well as hypnotherapists and therapists, get, have the appropriate training to be really effective in their respective disciplines in treating people with chronic pain. Uh, and how to manage it. And this is what is necessary, and the more we get training out there to train people that are appropriately qualified to practice in their disciplines, in their fields or professions, and are trained appropriately in hypnosis, the more we train all of these folks, that would include you folks, to use hypnosis for pain control, this is our way of beginning to chip away at solving the so-called opioid crisis, to provide effective and risk-free treatment to people that need it and suffer needlessly. With that said, I wanna just simply say that this today is, uh, and I guess I'll advance the slide here. Uh, I'm gonna just move over here. Uh, as I said, you know, we're not gonna have questions and answers until the end, because this is really the bare bones skeleton of a program that I'm launching for training pain control hypnosis practitioners. And I'm compiling an interest list, which is on my website, bruceimer.com. It's also available here for people that are interested in beginning and getting certified as a level one pain control hypnosis practitioner. It's a two day training, so this is the bare bones for that. And after you uh, take this two hour workshop, hopefully you'll be interested in learning more. There's a lot of material. Okay, so what are our learning objectives? Well, in this brief introduction, we're gonna, by the end of this, if you stay for the entire two hours or so, you're gonna be able to define pain scientifically, you're gonna be able to describe uh, the emotional triad of chronic pain. You're gonna be able to describe something that I've developed called the basic ID of chronic pain. You're gonna, describe, you're gonna be able to describe something I've developed called the aware model for mindfulness-based pain, mindfulness pain control. Um, you're gonna be able to explain how to assess what to target or focus on when you're called upon to use hypnosis for pain control, and of course, based on what your profession is. Uh, so Bryce, you're a dental surgeon, and some of the other folks here are uh, mental health therapists or professional hypnotherapists. So based on your discipline, of course, determining how to focus the use of the hypnosis tool to help your patients in your setting to control their pain and get pain relief. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I've coined the term taming pain. I co-authored a book that came out in 2020 with my good friend and colleague, Roy Hunter. It's called Taming Chronic Pain, uh, and I think the subtitle is uh, uh, Mindful Approaches to Bringing Pain Relief. In any event, I developed the concept of taming pain, which I find very useful to explain to patients, and I'll explain how that's done in this brief workshop. And uh, I'm gonna explain why hypnosis is the best tool in the world for non-drug treatment of people that suffer from pain issues. I'm gonna list the eight Ds of pain-controlled hypnosis, the eight Ds. 
And I explained that in detail, at least rudimentarily, in my book that I uh, published initially, actually, in 2003 or 2002, called Hypnotize Yourself Out of Pain Now, which is basically a self-help book. I've refined the model over the years, and of course, we'll just touch on it here, because of the Uh, I got a good uh, yeah, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Go ahead. All right. It's is fine. it still running? It's still running. The then you, you can't, you, then you can the work with that. still running? Huh? Yeah, it's gone. All right. Uh, so anyway, um, I've refined the concepts. It's very useful. You'll, you'll see what the ADs are, but in the two-day level one pain practitioner, pain control hypnosis practitioner training, you're going to learn how to do it and practice it and you know, you'll really get good at utilizing the eight D's of pain control hypnosis uh, for helping people. And uh, lastly, uh, after this workshop, if we have time, it's not a promise, I'm going to describe one hypnotic technique that no matter what your profession, you'll find useful in helping somebody calm down and relieve their pain pretty rapidly, within three minutes, okay? And so, with that said, I also want to make one disclosure, and the disclosure is that I have, I was going to say suffer, watch your language, sometimes I suffer, but I do have chronic pain as a result of a number of spinal issues. So I have sciatica, and I have leg pain, and I have back pain, and I'll tell you something, hypnosis has been a godsend for me. And so I live it, I know it, and I know what people go through and the importance of utilizing a tool to help a person to self-regulate and relieve their pain. Okay, now, next. Uh, I like the concept, can everybody see the PowerPoint? Kind of, sort of, can you see it, honey? Move, move on the side. All right. But it, it doesn't, let me show, let, let me, let me go. All right, no I, worries. Let's I'm see what sure more clear, yeah. It's not very clear. Wait, we can just, uh. Zoom, but no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's not gonna do it. All right, here we go. It's not gonna. No, it's not going to. Wait a second, hold it. Now it's, uh, if we can only. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Maybe you can just hold it like this. I don't know if you want to. I don't know. You are moving on the stage. Right. Let's go to You got to sit somewhere over there. You can't move because the whole video is going to be off. So you just need to move and you'll be fine. All right. Uh, thanks. So, uh, what do you think? Can you see? Yeah, I can see right. it now. So, you know, there's an acronym that was coined by uh, the late psychologist William Wester III, uh, was a past president of the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis. The acronym is called No More Pain. I find it very useful both as an assessment tool and as a way of explaining to patients how we're going to look at helping them and we can gauge, we can calibrate our hypnosis interventions to help patients with getting these objectives met. So, no more pain. We're talking about I'm going to help you to notice when you're comfortable, where you're comfortable. Hypnosis is an ideal tool for that. Uh, I'm going to teach you how to observe the control that you already have and improve that control so that you're much more adept at getting relief. I'm going to help you to motivate yourself to start doing things that are consistent with getting stronger, more flexible, and healthier. And I'm going to help you to, with hypnosis, which is the use of suggestion, I'm going to help you to overcome your resistance to making certain changes that are healthy for you by opening your mind to new choices and new decisions. And I'm going to help you learn a technique or two to relax in a regular way so that you can achieve calm, so that you can, uh, essentially, when you're relaxed, it's hard to be in pain at the same time. And some of you, you know, you might know yoga. If that works for you, wonderful. You might do meditation. If that works for you, that's a, that's a blessing. Uh, and I'm going to teach you a couple of self-hypnosis tools as well. 
And you know, one of the things that people have trouble with, especially when they suffer from chronic pain, is the fact that they're often not able to do stuff because they're in too much pain. So when they have a good day, they overdo it and they end up suffering even more for the next week. I've seen this for years with the patients I've treated in the pain clinics that I work in. Well, one of the things that's very important is to learn how, learn how important it is to evaluate your time constraints and what's your priority. So you need to learn how to pace yourself, how to schedule things, and how to focus on what's most important. Can't do everything. And then how about negative thinking? When you suffer from a chronic illness, you can't afford the luxury, so-called luxury, of negative thinking. And you're gonna learn how to recognize toxic negative thoughts that cloud the waters and make you suffer needlessly and replace those thoughts with appropriate positive thoughts that are realistic. And it's gonna be a gentle way of doing it. I don't believe in forcefully arguing with yourself. What I do believe in is accepting your thoughts and not fighting them and then working with them to gradually and gently change to more appropriate ways of thinking that are healthier. I mean, the whole goal here is to help you to become more comfortable and to function better. Uh, hey, we all know that stress and conflict isn't healthy, even though some people thrive on it, but it does exacerbate pain. And I'm gonna teach you the importance of avoiding stress and conflict. Of course, in order to do that, we have to identify what your conflicts are and what your sources of stress. And hypnosis, believe it or not, is an amazing tool for that. We're gonna help you to learn how to use your imagination to imagine the things that can make you feel better and function better. And guess what? If you're into any of the new age thinking, which has some validity, you're gonna know about manifestation. That you can manifest the things you want if you think about them, imagine them, want them, expect them to happen, and intend them to happen, and then basically do what you gotta do. And your imagination is your conduit. It's your tool for getting into that gear to actually make those changes and adjust your pain in a way that's healthier. We're not talking anything amazing here. We are talking amazing because if you're suffering from chronic pain, you know how great it would be to live with less pain. And last but not least, we're gonna talk about negotiating support from your system externally, meaning your family, the people you work with, your support system, and guess what? I also practice a form of therapy which is called parts therapy and I can teach you how to become aware of the different parts of you that essentially uh, regulate all of the things that go on in your life and also identify your pain part and begin to make friends with it and tame it and we'll get into that in a little while. Okay. So now let me get back to talking about this from the standpoint of you guys are all practitioners. It's very important in the first session to give the patient the expectation that something different is gonna happen here, that they're gonna get relief. This may be the only contact you have with this patient and therefore you want the experience to be positive and you want to use hypnosis so your patient can get a sample of what hypnosis really is, that it's not something that's voodooish or mysterious. You want to conduct a fast, meaning a rapid, targeted initial assessment of your patient, appropriate, of course, to your profession, in order to be able to formulate a plan of treatment. It doesn't have to be anything formal, uh, but of course, depending on your profession and your statutory regulations, you're gonna have to produce a treatment plan. Now, I do wanna say, and I have a slide about this a little bit later, that as psychologists, as mental health professionals, uh, you know, if you are uh, a social worker, if you're a therapist, psychotherapist, okay, um, we treat, we don't treat pain directly. We treat the emotional overlay associated with pain, which makes pain worse if it's uncontrolled anxiety, depression, anger, and impatience. Now, if you're a dentist, a nurse practitioner in a medical setting, or a physician, you have to deal with the emotional overlay too. But as a dentist, as a uh, physician, let's say a surgeon, or uh, a primary care doc, whatever, 
you are trained to address the physical and medical symptoms and aspects directly because of course you either do surgery or you do surgery and you prescribe pharmaceuticals. So therefore you can use hypnosis as a treatment tool to make your prescriptions and your surgery more effective and to help your patient be more comfortable and have more positive expectations which all the research that's been accumulated over the past two, no, I'm gonna say three decades, has shown that patients' expectancies of success lead to positive outcomes in pain reduction. Okay, now I'm gonna tell you something, which is basically the definition of taming pain. And oh, let me just simply say this, folks. Remember I said, this is why we're keeping questions to the very end. This is a bare bones introduction to a topic that I teach in a two day workshop. It's a lot of material and we probably won't get through everything. So it's okay because there's plenty of opportunities you're gonna have if you're interested in learning the whole kit and caboodle. And at the end, I will uh, show you where you can go to uh, register for our interest list if you would like to eventually, when we offer the next date of pain control hypnosis practitioner level one, so you can take it and get the whole kit and caboodle so you are able to practice fundamentally uh, and basically, you know, market yourself appropriately as a level one certified pain control hypnosis practitioner. Okay, so let's talk about taming, a concept of taming pain. I actually learned the concept of taming from a book that I read many years ago by a French author whose name was, I'll probably uh, mess up the name, and you know, of course I, uh, I don't have it here, but I think the name was Antoine Saint-Exubery. And mm -hmm. he wrote the book, The Little Prince. Mm -hmm. The Little Prince is a marvelous fairy tale. It's a thin little book. I highly recommend it. In the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through that, but I'm gonna say that I got the concept of taming from that book, and it just occurred to me as a light bulb in my head when I was writing Hypnotize Yourself Out of Pain back in 2000. Anyway, to tame your pain, here's it, here it is. It's about, you. of course, you suffer from chronic pain. You wanna gain control. You want to relieve it. You want to reduce it. Well, in order to do it, you can't fight it. Fighting it makes it worse, okay? It makes it worse. So to gain control over your pain, you have to become more intimate with it. Intimate with it, which basically sounds counterintuitive, but you know what? It really works, and I will explain that to you in a little bit so you can understand it and develop a relationship with it so it doesn't feel, because it is a part of you, it's one part of you, and it's there for a reason. It has survival value, even with chronic pain. With chronic pain, it doesn't have to be so extreme, but in order for you to make it less, without the harmful side effects of opioids and other things, you need to develop a relationship and understand the purpose of your chronic pain. Let me take a little wet your whistle moment here with my water so I can uh, lubricate my mouth and be able to talk some more. Okay. Um, to tame chronic pain incorporates the concept of mindfulness. We all know that mindfulness has been very popular in recent years, originally promoted by uh, the biologist. He's actually not a psychologist, he's a biologist. Uh, he's retired now from University of Massachusetts, John Kabat-Zinn, uh, who wrote uh, Full Catastrophe Living, which is about controlling pain with mindfulness, and it really took off. It's very popular, as you know, today. Taming pain is about mindfulness. It incorporates the I mean, in order to tame your pain, okay, if you suffer from chronic pain, and I know this personally from my own experience, you have to make the commitment to put the time into building a relationship with your persistent pain, and your pain will become softer, which is what your goal is. In order for something to become softer, you have to tame it. Okay, listen, I've trained big dogs, Rottweiler, German Shepherd, I, I'm familiar with Belgian Malinois and, of course, littler dogs. And I'm going to tell you, when I tame a dog, when I train a dog, of course, I have to build a relationship with that dog 
and uh, obviously show that individual, that dog, that I respect him or her and that I'm also the one in charge, but not through cruelty, but through appropriate strictness, consistency, regularity, care, concern, respect, and warmth, and kindness, and compassion. And this is what we're talking about. And guess what? If you take a hard dog, it can be harder to train that dog to be appropriately trained. But if you put the time into it, and you have the knack for it, and you develop the relationship with that dog, you can make it happen, and that dog will become softer, at least with you, and the people around him when you're around. When you commit to taming your chronic pain, you will also succeed in softening the hardness and the severity of the pain. I think I just said that. Okay, so what does it mean to be mindful and what is mindfulness? Well, mindfulness essentially means being present in the here and now without judging, okay? I think there was a book that was written by a guy named Richard Alpert, who was a LSD research psychologist from Harvard back in the 60s. He changed his name eventually to Baba Ram Das. He wrote the book, Be Here Now. And that was mindfulness a la the 1960s psychedelic age, which by the way, it's interesting, psychedelics are coming back now again. And there are respected uh, psychologists and therapists who purvey, uh, you know, great stuff in terms of techniques like internal family systems therapy, which is a form of parts therapy that I study, and they're talking about incorporating, integrating psychedelics into it. I don't know anything about it, but I'm just saying, uh, the point is that mindfulness when it comes to pain control is learning how to pay attention to your pain without judgment. We, we know from the research that the worst outcomes of not managing pain and getting worse, having multiple surgeries, resulting in more pain, that one of the most significant predictors of that is a concept called catastrophizing. That patients, and many people with chronic pain do that, and I saw so many over the years in the pain clinic, and it's always a challenge to help people to decatastrophize. But catastrophization and uncontrolled, rampant catastrophizing, which essentially is the chicken little syndrome. The sky is falling, it's the end of the world. I'm never gonna be able to stand up again. I'm gonna be in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. I'm gonna be suffering forever. The pain has no reasonable cause. It's mysterious, it's permanent, it's gonna last forever and it's gonna get worse. That's catastrophizing and patients that have those kinds of ne negative expectancies, they get worse. At least they don't get better. And so, by teaching mindfulness-based pain control, as I will essentially, well, we can't really do it today, but as I will give you the introduction to doing today, and if you take level one basic pain control practitioner, you'll learn how to do it. It's about helping people who suffer with persistent pain to number one, build their pain tolerance through mindfulness through the use of focusing and presence and you know, reducing judgment without self-recrimination, okay? It's gonna help those patients when they learn to focus on their pain instead of running from it, being afraid that it's gonna get worse if they focus on it, then they are able to better learn how to do the other thing, which is to redirect their attention away from the pain. Because there's no need, it's not like indicated that you say to somebody, well, I'm gonna teach you how to learn how to be with your pain. And they think, well, you're gonna have to like, I'm gonna have to learn to suffer. No, it's not about that. Because when you learn to be with your pain, you become ready to learn how to redirect your attention away from your pain and get relief. There's a time to be with your pain and there's a time to go elsewhere, okay? And of course, uh, I'm a psychologist and I treat people who suffered from trauma and we know from the research and from my own experience clinically over 35 years that people that suffer from chronic pain, and we're not blaming anybody here, but there tends to be a high incidence of early trauma and uh, late life trauma in patients that have intractable persistent pain syndromes. And so most people today with the emergence, you know, we have fads 
in the field of therapy, where one thing comes into favor and then it becomes condemned and something else comes into favor and then the old thing that was favored 25 years ago comes back again. And we've seen this especially in the field of, uh, we've seen it with opioids because there was a period at the end of the, uh, the, the 20th century where everybody was talking about you know, using long-term, long-acting opioids to help patients manage their pain and appropriate blood levels of narcotics in their system, blah, blah, blah. And then we had the opioid crisis emerging in the uh, essentially the second decade of 2022. Did I get that right? Let me see. We're talking about... Yeah, wait, but yeah, I'm sorry. It, we're talking about the end of the 20th century. I always get this mixed up. The end of the 20th century, right? So we're talking the 1990s. And, uh, and then, of course, in the beginning of the Y2K, which was the, I got it wrong again. The end of the 20th century, Y2K, talking about the 21st century, it turned full circle and everybody was anti-prescribing opioids. Well, let's turn this into talking about psychotherapy. Remember, there was a big interest in regression therapies and uh, re, uh, uh, refreshing memories back in the 80s and 90s, and you had the false memory movement, and then it became like, you know, uh, you know, the Antichrist, and you're not supposed to do that, and now people are starting to recognize it's important to understand your past. However, I teach patients that I'm going to help you to change your views or reframe your views about how your past affects your present. So we're not going to get mired in the past. What we need to do is we need to move on and reframe your views of how the past affects your present. Because what most affects your present is what you're doing now. And I'm going to teach you how to do other stuff so you can get pain relief. Would you be interested in that? And most people are. As long as I didn't lose rapport with the patient at that point when I'm saying that. So how might you, how might you explain all of this to a client or a patient? So you can think about that. That's essentially a thought question, and I'm not going to answer that. And of course, during the question and answer later, uh, I will uh, address any questions. And you know, if somebody wants to bring that up, you can. Um, let's talk about, very briefly, the consequences of opioid use. Well. People that use opioids, chronic pain patients who use opioids, and you always have to ask this. You want to know about this because it's often hidden, and you don't realize it until it's too late. You see people who are always late, they forget stuff, they're over sedated, and it turns out they're using opioids, they're misusing their opioids, and they're also mixing their opioids with benzodiazepines, and they're drinking, they're smoking marijuana, and I mean, it's like really a mess, and you have to be able to sort through it in order to be effective. So uh, let me just simply say this. The long-term use of uh, narcotics, i.e. opioids or opiates, leads to something called tolerance. And what that essentially means for our purposes is that you end up needing more of the drug in order to get the same amount of relief. And eventually you reach what's called an asymptote in statistics or a plateau where you, know, you need more and more and more and more and more and then suddenly it doesn't matter and you're not getting appropriate relief. And that also tends to trigger in a lot of well-intentioned patients the abuse, the accumulation, the seeking from other sources of different types of opioids. And it's also because our internal opioid factories, our bodies produce pain relieving chemicals through you know, nat natu natural activities. You know, when you exercise, when you relax, when you eat properly. And these are internal opioids that are attached to certain receptors in our uh, nervous system called mu receptors, mu like the cow, mu, and then there are certain other ones which I won't get into right now, but essentially what happens is the body slowly begins to shut down the production of internal opioids and um, such as endorphins, enkephalins, and other biochemicals and becomes more reliant on the drugs. And eventually you need more and more of the drug as the person's body just stops producing its own internal opioids. It's really bad. Now, let's talk about dependency. Well, we all know that 
opioids and benzodiazepines, the anxiety medications, promote, I mean biochemically, create biochemically a dependence on those drugs. This is a biochemical phenomenon. Obviously, all biochemical phenomena, physiological, neurophysiological, are modulated by psychological phenomena, personality factors, stress, blah, 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 okay? So you become, the patient becomes dependent on the medication chemically and psychologically, and of course they're gonna become dependent on it if it gives them relief. And you should know that opioids tend to have more of an effect in many patients many classes of chronic pain patients on reducing their anxiety as opposed to actually pure pain relief. Of course, that's hard to sort out uh, in research, but in my clinical experience, patients would overtake, over misuse their uh, narcotics, mostly often, often their short-acting immediate release opioids because they're using it for the anxiety reduction that it provides. And anxiety heightens pain, reduce anxiety, they feel less pain. So anyway, it does do that. And then they combine it with the benzos and they're over sedated. But here's the deal. We have something called addiction. And addiction is a psychological and a behavioral concept. It's not really a physiological concept at all. Essentially what addiction is, is when as a result of biochemical changes in the brain, yes, biochemical changes, <clears throat> and personality factors and environment, a person begins to depend on the drug, whatever the drug is, whether it's opioids, anxiety relievers, or some other kind of drug, a behavior that creates internal drugs such as sex addicts, uh, people that are addicted to gambling, uh, this kind of thing, road rage addicts. The point of the matter is, is that addiction is when, along with the biochemical changes in the brain, you develop uh, the need to have that drug and it becomes central to your life, most important, and you'll do anything to get it. And it ruins your life, it causes you disruptions in work, in family relationships, in you know, your integrity, and you will sell your mother's apartment in order to get the drug. An addiction is, that's addiction, okay. So, what predicts addiction? Well, we know that past histories of substance abuse, personality disorders, and uh, histories of trauma, not necessarily just the trauma, but the development of these substance abuse problems uh, along the way predict addiction. So I used to assess the risk of providing opioid treatment to patients in the pain clinic up front. And you know, there are a whole bunch of risk factors. I'll quickly list them. Risk factors for opioid abuse are the same risk factors for developing chronic pain syndrome, believe it or not. And they are, well, PD is the psychopathic deviant scale on the MMPI. It's a psychological thing, you know, I have given thousands of MMPIs, and you know, it is a certain profile that people at high risk have, and the psychopathic deviant scale elevated is one of them, but uh, you don't need to know that really. Borderline personality disorder, okay? Uh, in other words, behavior that is categorizable, that is uh, you know, essentially consistent with the criteria as listed in the DSM-5 for borderline personality disorder. Okay, we go into this in great detail as appropriate for treating chronic pain effectively in the pain practitioner uh, level one workshop. Poverty, unfortunately, so socioeconomic factors factor in here. I'm talking statistically, uh, it just is. Uh, history of trauma. Some of you might have, uh, be, have are familiar with the ACEs scale, or the ACEs questionnaire. Adverse. Does anybody know what that stands adverse for? Adverse childhood experience. Yes, thank you. ACEs stands for adverse childhood experiences scale, and that's very predictive. Uh, history of being abused, unfortunately. Sexual, physical, emotional. History of substance abuse. Previous history of opioids misuse or abuse. And family history of addiction happens to be a predictor. Okay, 
Let's take a breather right now and let's take a look at this ancient wisdom up on the PowerPoint. Time to take a little breather. Those of you that are here and those of you that are watching from home, when pain knocks on the door, wise ones breathe deeply and say, come in, sit down with me. And don't leave until you've taught me what I need to know. Think about that for a moment. Those of you that are watching and those of you that are here, take a few slow, deep breaths. And as a prelude to this great technique I'm going to teach you, maybe you'll put your hand, one or the other, on your abdomen and just sort of expand your abdomen as you inhale. Kind of contract your abdomen as you exhale. Just kind of take a, a few seconds to just relax and reflect on what this actually means. Pain knocks on your door. Do you run? Do you freak out? Do you catastrophize? Or do you take a deep breath and welcome the pain and say, come in, sit down with me and please stay with me and don't leave until you teach me what I need to know because pain is a teacher for better or for worse. The McGill Pain Questionnaire is a uh, written questionnaire that you can give your patients no matter what your profession is. It gives you a good idea of how your patient experiences the pain along three dimensions. The first one being physical descriptors of the pain, such as dull, aching, radiating, sharp, electric, stabbing, things of that nature. Second dimension would be the uh, uh, motivational, emotional dimension. So here we're talking about, oh man, my pain is depressing. Oh God, it's so tiring. I'll tell you, this pain is fearful. It's scary. Uh, this pain is so, so oppressing, oppressive. And then we have, last but not least, the cognitive evaluative dimension. We all make evaluations of good or bad. That's natural, that's human nature. But pain patients that are suffering needlessly and that are not functioning well because their pain controls them, will describe their pain cognitively, evaluatively, in terms such as, it's awful, it's horrible, it's strangling me, it's killing me, it's absolutely insufferable. It's, uh, oh my God, the descriptors that I've gotten from Patients who suffer from chronic pain and don't have good skills to regulate it, they talk about it's stabbing me in the back. That's obviously a, a physical descriptor. I feel like it's hanging me. It's strangling me. It's pulling me apart. So you see there's this catastrophic nature of the way that they describe their pain. And you know, the McGill Pain Questionnaire takes five minutes to administer. And of course it's language-based. So if a patient's education and literacy is at a low level, let's say below the sixth grade, uh, it's going to be hard to administer reliably. You might have to just kind of abbreviate it and just administer it as an interview because the patient's not going to understand a lot of the uh, words. But, uh, you know, if you're seeing people of a high school education or above, you can use it pretty profitably. Like all tools, it's not useful for everybody. Uh, nothing works all of the time. And then we get into the gate control model, which was developed by Ronald Melzack the late uh, physiological psychologist from the University of uh, Montreal, from McGill University in Montreal, and his partner, the late Patrick Wall, who, for some reason, I should know this, I don't remember what his profession was, but I do believe he was uh, from the UK. And Melzack and Wall wrote the book, The Puzzle of Pain, back in the 60s, and they developed gate control theory, or the gate control model of pain, which, uh, Truly, even though you'll hear so-called pain experts say that it's been quote-unquote disproven, don't believe it. The fact is, is that it's a model, and it's useful or not useful, and it's very useful for explaining 
to patients, no matter what your profession is, about the factors that make their pain worse through the nervous system and the factors that make their pain less or better. And we know that there's a gate in the nervous system. Of course, you, do you need to know exactly, precisely, what the physiological mechanisms are of that gate? No. But you do need to understand that the nervous system transmits sensory signals up the spinal cord to the brain, which interprets them, and then you perceive the sensations, and you interpret the sensations, and it's at that stage of perception, okay, where you can either suffer, and you know, the perception becomes like it's awful or horrible, or you can, using your brain, change, like in other words, not perceive it as the end of the world, the super threat, awful, and that kind of thing, and then the, uh, the brain sends counter signals down the spinal cord, the spinal thalamic tract, for those of you that want to know the exact area in the spinal cord, I kind of like to say that, it makes me feel like I'm an expert on physiology, you know, a spinal thalamic tract. But uh, the truth is, is that, yeah, the messages go down, these bundles of nerve fibers, and these messages can either make the pain feel worse or make the pain feel better. We're talking about modulation, neuromodulation. And neuromodulation is a concept that sounds complicated, it probably is. But from the standpoint of explaining it to patients, it's you can modulate the intensity of the pain signals. They come up, they're intense. We can modulate the intensity that you feel via different things that we do think and feel. And then the descending pathways down that nerve tract, that spinal thalamic tract, can actually tone down and modulate down the intensity of the pain signals. So here are some things that uh, open the gate, which means open the gate to pain and make pain feel unnecessarily worse. Sensory factors, injury, inactivity, long-term opioid use, poor body mechanics. For those of us here, well, you're a dentist. You know that if somebody has uh, jaw problems, TMJ, what have you, clenching and uh, uh, bruxing and bracing and neck tension and all of the above will uh, exacerbate the pain that they feel uh, in their gums and their teeth and the roots and the nerves and the jaw. Uh, and that's body mechanics for a dental surgeon. But of course, if you're talking about back pain, you're talking about posture, you're talking about uh, you know, how people walk, how they hold themselves, et cetera, et cetera. And poor pacing of activities. People that overdo it, people that you know just do everything at once, people that are impatient and just uh, don't pace themselves. Okay, cognitive factors which make the pain gates open in the nervous system and make pain worse are things such as, now let's distinguish this. We talked about mindfulness, which is being present and being able to focus without judgment. But here we're talking about focusing on the chronic pain and focusing on how miserable you feel focusing on it in that kind of way, in a catastrophic kind of way. Lack of any interests, no distractions. It's like, oh my God, the pain's ruined my life, and you're just sitting there popping opioids and benzos and feeling just miserable. Worrying about the pain, expecting it to get worse, basically thinking to yourself with these negative expectancies, the pain's permanent, it's never gonna go away, you're never gonna discover the cause of it, it's mysterious, it's awful, and it's gonna get worse. That's catastrophizing and other negative thoughts. And last but not least, the emotional factors. I'm gonna have a little slide in a minute about the emotional triad. The emotional triad of persistent pain is anxiety, depression, and anger, which leads to, or is associated with impatience. Impatience, you know, anger, impatient. I wanna get rid of it now. I can't stand this. Anyway. The emotional factors that open the gate are depression, anxiety, anger, rage, stress, frustration, hopelessness, and helplessness. Pain gate closers. The gate control theory says, you know, you want to 
reduce the amount of sensations that get registered in the thalamus and those other areas of the brain that essentially decode those transmissions of sensory signals from nociceptors in the body. Okay, well, let's, what, what does that? Well, sensory factors would be like doing things that are fun. Pleasure is the opposite of pain. Short-term use of pain medication. I'm talking about not developing dependency and shutting down the uh, internal opioid factors. Relaxation training and meditation, okay? Yoga. Cognitive factors would be having interests, thoughts associated with self-efficacy, and distraction. But you can't distract yourself if you don't know how to focus on your pain mindfully. That's something we cover in level one pain control practitioner training. It's you know something we have to actually flesh out and then we actually practice in dyads and triads how to tell a patient, explain to a patient this idea that you'll learn to be mindful and then you'll be really good at distracting yourself. But if you run from the pain, you judge your pain, you think of your pain as an enemy, you wanna kill your pain, you're not gonna be as apt to learn to distract yourself. And emotional factors would be like things like positive attitude, overcoming depression, uh, becoming assured that the pain is not harmful, and feeling in control. Probably most of you here are familiar with the uh, you know kind of ubiquitous uh, scale of you know how much pain are you in from zero, which is no pain, all the way to the worst pain you can imagine or the worst pain you could imagine that you've ever had, which is a 10, and you know, sort of gradating it, you know, rating it on a scale. We're not gonna get into this now. Let me tell you, pain patients that I've seen uh, in my private practice and in the pain clinic, they're asked this so many times, they hate it. You can't just do that. You can't say, how's your pain today? Oh my God, that's what a lot of people that aren't trained in pain management do. How's your pain today? Give me a number from one to 10, yeah, come on. This is primitive, it's untrained, it's unsophisticated. You have to learn how to assess pain. We do that in level one, basic pain control practitioner training. And I'm, you know, honestly, I'm not trying to plug this stuff. I'm promoting something that's very important that people who need to learn this stuff because they can help patients expand their practice, develop a practice niche, would benefit from taking the two-day level one pain practitioner. And we can't do all this in two hours. It's a two-day affair. Um, but anyway, you know, we, we teach people, you know, how to do this eloquently, elegantly, so patients don't get angry. And you want to ask about the following when you do an initial assessment. This is just bare bones, okay? You want to, first of all, you want to get the patient's explanation of their pain, the description of their pain, you know. Um, and don't forget, I mean, I was seeing a pain patient the other day and she was complaining, of, she's abusing her opioids, she needed to uh, get detox. And I really wanted to understand what kind of pain she originally was taking the opioids for. My back, my back, my back. I asked her more questions, it turns out she's got neck issues too. And then pain generalizes physically because of uh, a host of physical factors. So she's also got carpal tunnel syndrome, okay? And she's got headaches, so you know. You want to get a description of the locations of the pain and uh, the description of what it feels like. Uh, you want to get an understanding of how often the pain is there, you know. Is it recurrent? Is it uh, episodic? Is it continual? Uh, you know, does the patient feel it's constant? Uh, you want to find out what does the patient believe about the origins? Like, where did it come from? How did it start? What do you think causes this? And what do you think started in the first place? You want to find out the pain locations, as I said, physically, pain descriptions, pain severity, medications and treatments. And I always ask, what percentage of relief do you feel you get from this medication, from that medication? How much relief percentage-wise from zero to 100% do you think physical therapy gave you when you were doing the exercises, when you weren't doing the exercises, et cetera, et cetera? Self-help and coping strategies. What does the patient uh, do? You want to find out what, you know, what kinds of skills do they have in coping? Uh, I told you reported pain relief from zero to 100% for any of the things that they do or have done to them. By the way, in the cognitive behavioral literature, the CBT literature, what we know, and it's very valid, it's been shown by research, 
research by Dennis Turk and other colleagues of his. Uh, they started out at the Pittsburgh School of Medicine and there was a pain clinic there. And the bottom line is they discovered that, uh, holy cow, I just lost my train of thought. Can somebody just simply say what the last thing I said was? I just completely just blew away. They discovered something in the clinic, the dentists. CBT. 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 Thank you. Memory works by association. <laughs> you get the right trigger, and it's like, oh, it all comes back to you. So thank you, thank you. So basically, the CBT literature, Dennis Turk and his colleagues, University of uh, Pittsburgh, and all of that, they discovered that it's just as important what a patient with persistent pain does for him or herself as what is done to him or her. In fact, it's often more important, okay? More important what you do, what you do for yourself. Because no medicine, nothing, no surgery, no interventions work unless you adhere to the, to the treatment plan. Um, reported pain-related impairment, I mean, that essentially is, you know, how physically impaired or cognitively impaired is the person and then there's the concept of disability, which essentially means that they can't perform their necessary functions of life in terms of uh, work and uh, you know, activities of daily living, et cetera, which can be attributed to pain impairment. Opioid risk questions are very important. I'm not gonna get into it now, we don't have the time. Because remember I said earlier that people at high risk for opioid abuse are at high risk for chronic pain. Depression and anxiety symptoms, and that's that. All right, so this is like, we're not definitely not getting into this here, but you should have a basic familiarity with the physiology or neurophysiology of pain perception so that you have a model in your head that you can then explain to your patient that they can understand. Time to get another drink of water. Thank you. Ah. I mean, basically what we're talking about here is the idea that there's, like I said, ascending, moving up to the brain from the periphery, from the peripheral sensory nerves, the uh, noxious sensation receptors or nauseceptors, you know, uh, transmission of signal, sensory signals up the spinal cord to the brain, that's the ascending pathway, ascending meaning going up, and then the transmission of modulating factors going down the same spinal, a different lane of the spinal thalamic tract, they don't collide. And uh, it is physiologically shown, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, research, autopsies, cadavers, that there are actually microscopic examination of the spinal thalamic tract. If there's an ascending pathway, there's a descending pathway. And nature, your higher power, God, was pretty smart in designing this so that you don't have people going uh, in the reverse direction in a one-way lane. Um, and uh, so we're talking about transduction, which is essentially the production, the creation, you know, if you have like a little, uh, you know, a pinch on your arm, that's, that's a physical uh, stimulus, which then is transformed or transduced into an electrical, chemical electrical signal in the nerves. And that chemical electrical signal is then transmitted. So we're talking transmission. It's got to go somewhere and it's going up to the brain, right? It happens in split second, fractions of a second. And then you have modulation which is essentially what does the brain in a reflexive way do to modulate, to moderate, to, to essentially adjust that signal. You know, I mean, uh, otherwise people with chronic pain syndrome, again, this is too complicated to get into in this two hour lecture, but people with chronic pain syndrome have something called pain amplification syndrome, where their CNS, their central nervous system and their peripheral nervous system becomes hypersensitive to all types of stimuli. And so it, the nerves are excitable, they're hyper excitable, they overreact and um, there's very poor modulation. Okay, perception would essentially be, well, 
it would be at, before and after modulation. So essentially, you know, you're really talking about the modulation of the intensity of the signal and then the perception of what the signal means. That's what perception is. Sensation is essentially the transmission of chemical electrical signals and perception is how the person interprets those signals. It happens in a split second, right? Interpretation, which kind of goes beyond perception, which is like, what is the implications of this, you know? And then behavior, you know, what does the person then do? And I mean, this is a whole thing we could spend like easily like a half hour on this, which we're not gonna do. So here's the question. Take a moment to reflect. What is the clinical application of this path of the diagram I just showed you? In other words, how can you, depending on what your profession is, and if you're working with people with chronic pain, how can you simply explain pain physiology, pain physiology 101, to a client or patient to set positive expectations for pain control hypnosis? So I'm gonna just stop for 60 seconds, take a breather, reflect on this question. If you wanna ask it during the Q&A later, you're welcome to. No questions now, just reflect. Take a moment just to breathe. I, I just have to uh, look at something here because I'm not sure what exactly happened here. I just need to uh, see where a slide, a series of slides went. So just give me a, a minute. We, we skip some things, but it's okay, because I'm gonna cover them anyway. <laughs> All right, slide, uh, what do we do here? Go to current slide. All right. All right, so, you know, we uh, talk about pain as a signal. I didn't even define pain for you guys. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to define pain. I got to define pain scientifically. So we got to go back again. I don't know how this happened, but you know, it's called Murphy's Law, right? And we're going to define pain. We're going to simply, here's a, all right, first of all, in Roman mythology, Poena is the spirit of punishment. First, you lost your signal up there. I did. Yeah, wow. Now what? I don't know. See? Mm. How do you have it connected there? The, the Egyptian doesn't recognize. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, you know how to. Let's see. We're not going to waste time, so I'll just talk without the slides if I have to. You know? I don't know why. Oops. No, you did not want that. Yeah. You know what we're going to do? I'll tell you what. For the next half hour, who's going to talk? I, I'm gonna use my uh, paper as a guide, and maybe if I need the whiteboard, I'll use it, and uh, no problem. All right, so in Roman mythology, Poena is the spirit of punishment and the attendant of punishment 
to Nemesis, the goddess of divine retribution, Poena, okay? The Latin word poena means pain. It's also synonymous with punishment, penalty, and penance, and it gave rise to the English word pain. I mean, most people that suffer from chronic pain feel that it's like a punishment. Now, there is a definition of pain, um, and if you want this, you can look it up on Google, or you can, you know, I can send you uh, part of this PowerPoint, maybe the whole PowerPoint for that matter, I don't know. Uh, if, you, uh, if you go on my website, if you go on my website and you go to the page which is entitled Level 1 Pain Practitioner, I'm sorry, Level 1, I tried to find a more, you know, uh, parsimonious way of saying this, but it's basically Level 1 Pain Control Hypnosis Practitioner Training. Sign up for the interest list. Then I will have your email and I can send you this PowerPoint. It has these definitions. So the International Association for the Study of Pain, or IASP, defines pain, you know, I apologize that this projector uh, probably had too much pain in the form of thermal stimulation or heat, and it just uh, decided to shut down <laughs> for, as a self-protective mechanism. Well, IASP, says that pain, now listen to this definition, it's very elucidating. Pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. Okay, so you see, they're saying that it's either related to actual tissue damage or it's just described in terms of such damage. So pain is pain, and the person experiencing it is experiencing pain, unless they're malingering. And it doesn't necessarily mean that there's anything physically damaged. We know that it's a complete lack of correlation between MRI findings of physical damage, the extent of physical damage, and especially with back patients, low back pain syndrome, and the extent of disability, all right? So what this definition highlights is that pain is an unpleasant experience. Of course, that's an oxymoron. And it has sensory aspects, it has emotional aspects, and it's associated with perceived damage to the body. Something's wrong with me, something's getting worse. Oh, I, I need to tell you, rule number one, especially for those of us that are therapists as opposed to dentists or physicians, and that is do not treat unless an appropriate medical and or dental evaluation has been conducted as appropriate because we don't want to mask pain symptoms. Uh, we don't want to uh, prevent appropriate treatment of a physical problem that's causing the pain. This is unethical and you'll get sued. Uh, don't start using pain control hypnosis willy-nilly and uh, you know, hypnotize people away. Uh, people kind of originally, when I came out with the title of my 2001 book, Hypnotize Yourself Out of Pain Now, thought the title was kind of hokey, uh, and it kind of is, but I wanted to have people kind of, you know, be interested in it, you know, it was a little controversial, but, you know, people like Harvard radiologist, uh, Elena, I'm thinking Rigby, it's not Rigby, it's Elena, I forget her name, she's very big in comfort uh, language, and she's a radiologist, whatever, it doesn't matter, but people with very great credentials read the book and they said, oh wow, it's really legit. The title is like, uh, you know, hokey, but in any event, we don't want to hypnotize pain away unless we know what's causing it, and you need to have a proper uh, go-ahead, and you need to have the physician or dentist, depending on the situation, sign off on the use of uh, hypnotic techniques. Um, so, because we don't want to mask a problem that needs to be treated. So, a better definition of pain that was actually published by Howard Price, who uh, is a psychologist, uh, I don't know what he specialized in, came out in 1999. It was a sort of modification of this definition that I just quoted. He says it like this, it's really good. Listen carefully. Pain is an unpleasant bodily experience, right? The pain is in your body. You know how many patients I've seen over the years? I can't tell you how many. Thousands. 
doing this for over 30 years, 35 years. Thousands of patients who say initially, what are you gonna tell me the pain's all in my head? The doctors tell me the pain's all in my head. Hey, the pain's not all in your head, but you feel the pain in your body, it's in your body. I, I know it's real, it's in your body. I wanna help you to learn how to control it and that involves using both your brain, i.e. your head, and your body. Hey, okay. So pain is an unpleasant bodily experience, because we're talking about physical pain here, we're not talking about emotional pain. Pain is an unpleasant bodily experience that feels like something in the body has been or is being damaged or destroyed. That feels like a threat to or interference with one's ongoing functionality and health, and it's associated with negative emotions, such as fear, anxiety, anger, or depression. It's a great definition. It basically addresses the triad of affective, motivational, sensory, physical, and cognitive evaluative factors that have been well fleshed out by the gate control model. All right, we didn't cover this, I forgot to, I don't know how I skipped it, but pain is adaptive, it's a signal that something's wrong, people that don't feel pain uh, can die because they don't uh, get those signals from their body that their hand is on the fire, or that they just uh, you know, sprained their ankle, or worse yet, that they just broke their neck, or whatever it is. Um, so acute pain is a signal, it's like an alarm. It needs to be heated, acute pain. What about recurrent acute pain? That's like repeated alarms. So once the message is clear, they don't have to be as loud now, do they? Chronic pain, on the other hand, is a burden. It's a burden. And people who suffer from chronic pain, they plow along like draught horses, you know, uh, toting those heavy bear, beer wagons that, you know, they do in, uh, in Germany and Austria and they suffer. It's a burden and it makes life more difficult. It's an energy drain. It's our job, if we're gonna take it, if we accept the mission, to help the patient become unburdened, okay? I'll repeat it again, this is important. Chronic pain is a burden. It's our job to help the patient become unburdened. So how can we use hypnosis to accomplish this? Boy, I'm glad that I caught myself and got back to this. All right. Okay, chronic pain. Hurt does not always equal harm. Does it have survival value? Yes. Why? Think about it for a moment. How can chronic pain have survival value? Well, heck, usually there is damage. There's something going on in the body and the mind that's causing the pain, and the survival value is to alerting you if you're willing to learn. Remember that Zen uh, little mantra that said, pain knocks on your door and you say, welcome, come on in, sit down with me and stay with me until you teach me what I need to know. So if you can develop rapport with a person with persistent pain, to teach that individual what the survival value is of his or her chronic pain, guess what? You're on your way to helping that person tame their pain. Physical and emotional consequences of chronic pain, untethered and untamed, are depression and anxiety and anger and rage and alienation and hostility and disability. It's, it's, you know, it's awful, it ruins people's lives. And why is chronic pain so difficult to treat? Well, without getting into all the details, let me just simply say, because it's multimodal. It's not just sensory, it's not just a physical thing. You're talking about the life of that person, you know, their behavior, their habits, their emotional status, uh, their, you know, the sensory physical aspects, how they think, how they picture things in their mind, their imagination, uh, how they relate to other people, their interpersonal dysfunction, uh, their use of drugs, their diet, their, uh, you know, exercise habits, their sleep patterns. Oh my God, and it's so complicated and, uh, you know, you gotta learn how to, if you wanna be effective as a hypnotherapist, if you can learn how to really assess what's important, you can actually treat somebody and help them significantly get control over their pain in uh, 
seriously in anywhere from six to 12 sessions. I'm not saying, you know, this is not like uh, all the time and, you know, there's always issues that are involved, but uh, you could really teach somebody a lot if you develop their rapport and really help them. Um, and uh, we covered this. Okay, so let's move on to hypnosis now. This is, after all, the International Medical and Dental Hypnotherapy Association. So, hypnosis is an evidence-based therapy tool for treating patients with chronic pain. It can address both the emotional overlay and the sensory physical aspects of subjective pain. Earlier I mentioned, without seeing the slide, to remind me that dentists and physicians treat both the physical and the emotional, because if you neglect the emotional, you don't usually get as much success with the physical. And therapists and hypnotherapists treat the emotional. So why hypnosis? Well, hypnosis has no side effects. Not really, unless it's misused, okay? Uh, there is a paper I would draw your attention to. You should remember it, I wrote it. It's called The Inadvertent Negative Consequences. I can't even remember the name of this paper but it's in the American Journal of Clinical Hypnosis. I believe it was a special issue that I was guest editing in 2012. So if you look up American Journal of Clinical Hypnosis 2012, Bruce Eimer, there's an article in there, it's the flagship article called Inadvertent Negative Consequences of uh, the Misuse of Hypnosis or something, and it talks about how you can mess up. You can mess up with hypnosis. Believe it or not, and then you can get sued. So read the article. It's free. It's on my website. Just go to bruceimer.com and read it. Uh, okay. Hypnosis has no side effects unless it's misused. It is no substitute for medical or dental treatment. It comes without effort. Hypnosis is effortless. Pain comes without effort. Hypnosis taps into the imagination, as does pain. And hypnosis, if used properly, transforms your patient's pain trance. The negative hypnosis of pain is a pain trance. It, you can help somebody transform your, their pain trance into a positive trance. So what can hypnosis address? Well, we kind of already alluded to this. It can address beliefs, attitudes, thinking, emotions, motivation sensory and perceptual issues and responses, motor responses, how people react, the excitability in the central nervous system, what they do. And basically, the idea is that, you know, I've been working with people with chronic pain somehow in one form or another since like 1985, believe it or not. And that's a whole story, but Hypnosis enables us to address this complex problem of persistent pain in an effective, much simpler way. Hypnosis is simple. I'm not saying it's easy to develop really good skill in using it, but it's simple. And hypnosis and the central nervous system, my lord. Hypnosis, I'm mean, sorry, chronic pain, as I mentioned earlier, is, is associated with abnormal excitability of the nerve fibers that send pain messages up to the brain and a lack of effective mechanisms in the brain to modulate it and to dampen the transmission of these messages. Therefore, low intensity, painful, and non-painful stimuli can elicit or aggravate pain, and that's called pain amplification syndrome, or for those of you that like acronyms, PAS. PAS is responsive to the use of hypnosis when the person affected is positively responsive to hypnosis. Hypnosis somehow closes the pain gate in the central nervous system and it works on multiple levels simultaneously. Okay. Chronic pain patients tend to be disillusioned. They have a very heavy emotional overlay. And you know what? Don't go in there saying, you gotta do this, you gotta do that, you gotta stop this. That's like trying to do surgery and cut it out. You don't wanna do it. People suffering from chronic pain erect a lot of walls for blocking people out, for protecting themselves from more pain, emotionally, physically. It's a defense mechanism. 
So it's understandable. It's a protective mechanism. Their defense mechanisms, defense mechanisms are a part of them. You have to respect their parts, their defense mechanisms. But it also blocks them from getting well. So, got to have rapport. We're going back to the idea of taming the pain. And the thing about it is, you all know this, I'm sure. Healthcare professionals who see chronic pain patients tend to also get disillusioned. And when that happens, it's time to retire, bud, and go into a different uh, specialty. Don't see pain patients if you're angry with them, if you dismiss them, and uh, if you think they're not going to get well. Milton Erickson, you know, one of the uh, famous pioneers of modern hypnosis, used to say, and I'm just paraphrasing here, uh, he said that if you expect it to work, it will work. If you expect it to not work or fail, it'll fail. Hypnosis is a confidence game. It falls apart if you're not confident and if the patient lacks confidence in you. I don't know where I heard that, but it's cool. Hypnosis is a confidence game. Both your patient, your client, and you have to have confidence that what you're doing works. All right. Talked about Establishing a relationship. I'll, re I'll just say this again. To tame means to establish ties. It means to gradually and patiently build an emotional connection and an attachment to something using your heart. You gotta be patient. It doesn't happen overnight. And you gotta put the time into building that relationship with that something that you want to tame. And you have to observe all the proper rituals. You can't skip steps. And uh, Antoine, Saint, <laughs> Antoine de Saint-Exubery. Mm -hmm. I think he was Belgian, right? He was he French or Belgian? Belgian. Belgian. And the Little Prince, New York. Harcourt, Har Harcourt Grace World Publishers, 1943. He said, this is, uh, this is a quote, to tame means to establish ties. It means to gradually and patiently build an emotional connection, attachment to something using your heart. It requires patience. You must put the time into building your relationship with that something while you observe all the proper rituals. You can't try to take shortcuts. Ah, can't take shortcuts. And uh, this, is, this is the most beautiful part of this definition. He says, well, Fox says to the little prince who wants the little, the little prince drop into the desert from space and he sees a fox, he wants to make friends and the fox said, I, won't, I can't be friends with you until you first tame me. And the uh, little prince says, uh, what means to tame? And the fox gives him this definition and he says, among other things, you become responsible forever for what you have tamed and your relationship becomes unique. And if you think about it as a clinician, as a therapist, as a dentist, as a doctor, if you tame somebody, you know, if you tame somebody's pain or medical problem, dental problem, whatever, and you really help them, you develop a relationship that lasts throughout time. They always are grateful. All right, kind of gloss over some things here. All right, and you know, oh my God, this is, I'm going to have to draw something on this uh, whiteboard because uh, I can't just say this stuff. So I'm going to just, you know, remember I said that uh, this, this workshop, given time and everything, the amount of time we have or don't have, we, we're not going to cover everything and we're not. But this is the skeleton for level one basic practitioner training, two day training. We have an interest list you can sign up for so you can be the first to register when the next date is uh, posted on my website. Uh, I don't have the PowerPoint, but I have a handout. And I have two handouts, actually. And you can uh, Here, I'll help you. hand them out. I would appreciate them. And it, it actually has my website address and 
a, a description of level one pain, hypno pain control hypnosis training. Thank you. All right, so basically, oh, one thing I forgot, God, business. Did you collect tickets? I did. Everybody, everybody raise your hand if you uh, registered and have tickets. Tickets, tickets. Did you register and have tickets? Yeah, they all have tickets? I've got okay. them all. Okay, good, thanks. Okay. All, right. all right, good. Thank you. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you something. This is useful, and it's a basis for doing stuff. So there's a concept which is called basic ID. It comes from the work of the late psychologist who was a mentor of mine, Dr. Arnold Lazarus, who was a professor at Princeton. He was the founder of something called multimodal behavior therapy. It's a form of cognitive behavior therapy. And the basic ID is this. B stands for behavior. A stands for affect or emotions. S stands for sensation. See how this is fleshing out in light of what we talked about earlier. I stands for imagery. C stands for cognitive. I stands for interpersonal. And D stands for drugs. All right, so what do these things have to do with anything? Well, it's a framework for understanding a person's adjustment or lack of adjustment. And it gives you a way of understanding what is the problem. We have interviews for this, okay? So we got like behavior, okay. Think about a person suffering from chronic pain and has a disability. They have behavioral excesses, they have behavioral deficits. Excesses would be something like complaining, moaning, holding the wall as you walk, um, anger, drug use, you know, overuse, abuse. Deficits, well, things like avoidance, not doing stuff, lying in bed all the time, um, avoiding interacting with people, um, flat affect, uh, go on and on. And uh, by the way, these seven categories or dimensions, they're not exclusive, which means there's overlap. What about affect and emotions? Well, for chronic pain, you're talking about anxiety, depression, anger, impatience, hostility, alienation, all those nasties. Sensation. Here we're talking about um, an unpleasant bodily experience. Recall the definition of pain by the International Association for the Study of Pain and by Howard Price. Imagery. Oh, so the imagery is so extreme and colorful. The more extreme and colorful the imagery in a negative way, the worse the outcomes you can predict. People that are, I got a noose around my neck, I got a, 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 a dagger stabbing me in the back. It feels like my arms are on fire and burning up. Uh, you know, I feel like I have a hammer hitting me in the head. There's a hot poker behind my eye. Um, I feel like I'm strangling. I feel like I got an elephant on my chest. All of these extreme images provide targets for intervention with hypnosis, which is the language of imagination. Cognitive, we're talking about the cognitive evaluative dimension. So we're talking about patients who are gonna say things like, um, the pain is killing me, it's awful. It's excruciating. It's, uh, uh, it's um, you know, all the, all the negative stuff, okay? I, I, you know, my verbal fluency is fading, so sorry about that. The affect that we talk about, uh, it's depressing, uh, it's fatiguing, things like that. And then interpersonal, we're talking about excesses and deficits, okay? Excesses would be things like <clears throat> irritability, it would be things like aggressive. It would be things like 
uh, drug seeking. It would be things like um, snapping. It would be things like, uh, you know, um, impatient. Okay. And deficits would be avoiding people, avoiding social interactions, not wanting to be seen or heard, expecting rejection. Okay. And last, the drugs. Drugs in this model basically refers to all biological factors. So we're talking about medicines, recreational drug abuse, substance abuse, alcohol abuse, polysubstance abuse, mixing alcohol with opioids, opiate abuse. We're talking about uh, terrible diet. We're talking about lack of exercise, lack of physical conditioning. We're talking about horrible sleep habits, not sleeping at night, waking up at night, uh, inconsistency as far as sleep habits, things of that nature. Okay, now, all of these uh, categories provide points of intervention. Now, what I did was, I kind of, you know, I, I'm, I'm really into acronyms, if you don't pick that up already, and I find them kind of useful, although they simplify things, but we do want to simplify things, especially uh, when we uh, want to reach patients. I developed a concept based on mindfulness for taming pain called the AWARE model. Mm -hmm. And let's take this one, and we have an acronym, which is AWARE. You know, nowadays there's psychotherapy for everything, and I recently saw that there's a psychotherapy out there called AWARE psychotherapy. I've like, never heard of it. You know, I mean, I didn't, you know, use that to do this, but it, this is pretty useful. So A stands for acceptance. And if you recall earlier, I said that the cognitive behavioral literature basically has a dictum that says that it's just as important what you do for yourself as what the system does for you, if not more important. You have to accept responsibility, not blame, but responsibility for what you do about your pain. You have to accept your pain. And because I like to work using hypnosis and parts therapy, I say your pain is a part of you. It's not your enemy and nothing wants to be killed. So when you start using painkillers and all this stuff, kill the pain, kill the pain, the pain's gonna fight back. So you have to accept it, even though you may not like it, of course you don't like it. You don't have to suffer, because a quote from my mentor, Dr. Dabney Ewan, who was a surgeon in New Orleans, an emergency room physician, who pioneered the use of hypnosis in the emergency room treatment of burns, he used to say that pure pain, uh, how do you say it like this? Pure, <laughs> uh, Oh my God, I'm blocking again. This is that verbal fluency problem when I get tired. But what did he say? Give me a second because this is really important. And I gotta jog, I gotta jog my memory. Uh, here it is. Sorry. Pure pain doesn't hurt as much as pain with suffering. Minus the suffering component, you're gonna get relief. He also said, pain may be mandatory but suffering is optional. And guess what? How many people have heard patients being told by their treating physicians, you gotta learn to live with the pain? Don't ever say that. If you, I mean, try to avoid it, because the unconscious, which is literal, interprets that as meaning that in order for me to have no pain, I gotta die. And so pain does have a lot of survival value. It helps you stay alive, doesn't it? Well, what would be better? Of course you want the patient to learn to live with the pain, but you want to communicate it in a way that the unconscious is able to pick up and do something with it and give you, lay a seed for your hypnosis. So rather than saying you gotta to learn to live with the pain, you say to the patient, I can teach you to learn to live with less pain. Hey, what does that say? How is that different, friend? You gotta to learn to live with the pain. I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna teach you how to learn to live with less pain. Take a moment, 30 seconds, to breathe and reflect on that distinction. So the last thing we're gonna do in the time we have, because I did promise question and answer, uh, 
opportunity is I'm going to show you the AWARE model. It's a framework for intervention. Hmm. Sorry, we didn't get to the eight Ds, and I do want to show you this very great technique that you can use no matter what your discipline and wherever you're seeing a pain patient, it really usually works. Not always, but here it is. Okay, so acceptance of your responsibility about what you do for your pain. What is W? Well, W stands for watch or observe without judgment. Okay? You gotta learn what's going on before you do anything about it. And then when you learn what's up, now we can adjust. That's the next day. And we're talking about adjusting your behavior, your thinking, your responses, uh, all of the above. And uh, I want to make a very important distinction, okay? Listen, I, I make the disclosure again. I live with persistent pain. I wake up with a lot of pain going down my uh, legs from my uh, spinal stenosis. I have scoliosis and spinal stenosis, a great combination. Actually, I have the four S's of spinal disease. Spondylosis, scoliosis, spondylolisthesis. What's the fourth one? Spondylosis, whatever. Anyway, it's physical. Wakes me up at night, causes radiation of pain, sciatica. You know, when I'm in a lot of pain, if I didn't prepare in advance what I'm going to do to adjust, Get it. So you got to teach patients how to plan how they're going to adjust their responses in advance using hypnosis. What is the R? Well, the R is very important, and what it stands for is review and release. So basically, what we're talking about here is helping identify the emotional burdens that are bogging the patient down, making their pain worse, and coming up with appropriate strategies for helping them to release those burdens, especially resentment and hatefulness and forgiving themselves. Forgiveness is a big part of getting pain relief. Last but not least is the E, and the E stands for envision. And basically what Envision is, is it's like uh, if you're a hypnotist, you understand the whole idea of um, kind of like mentally rehearsing how you're going to handle a difficult situation in advance, seeing yourself as successful. It's like future pacing in NLP. And it's essentially, here's, here's how it really applies. I wrote this down, and if I can't find it, I'll just hit it. Oh, okay, here we go. Release has to do with releasing old emotional burdens, stopping punishment of yourself and others. Okay? And envisioning stands for envisioning how you're going to deal with pain flare ups and your emotional uh, reactions. All right, so time has dictated that we come to a close as far as this didactic piece. And now I'd like to thank you all for listening patiently and open this up for some questions. <clears throat> so then, <clears throat> starting with very practical, that uh, often we advise clients, patients, to re replace work pain for discomfort or for something specific, like probing sensation, burning sensation. Is it kind of tricky or of so value? Yeah, thanks for asking this, I, uh, this question. You know, this is a debate, but um, I firmly believe that you want to use the language of the patient. And they're talking about pain and I use pain. It's kind of hokey to just not use the term. You know, it's almost like the political correctness of today, you know, cancel culture. You know, talk about pain. You know, you got pain, we're going to help you deal with your pain. So, you know, you want to 